I, um, for more than 30 years now, I've been a runner. I know it's hard to imagine that looking at me, but it's true. And um, let's see, in April, I'm running the Annapolis 10 miler. In October, the Army 10 miler. And in, also in October, the uh, Marine Corps Marathon. So I'm, I'm still training. It doesn't look like it, but I am. And I remember years ago, when I first started running, a friend of mine said, um, you know, you should subscribe to Runner's World magazine. They give you lots of tips and advice on how to run, how to do it better, and so forth. And so I subscribed and read it for many years. I don't get it now because I know all that stuff. What, am, what else am I going to learn after all this time? But um, I'll never forget one ad that appeared in Runner's World. It was a, a picture of a runner running, and it was advertising a shoe, a brand of running shoe, and I don't remember what the brand of running shoe was, but it had this guy running along, and as he was running, he had his, his finger to the side of his nose, and he was going, <laughs> and the tagline was, yeah, we're different. <laughs> Runners are different. I mean, they get up at ungodly hours of the morning, they run ungodly distances, and here's this thing saying, yeah, we're different. You know, sometimes Christians say, yeah, we're different. We're different from everybody else. We don't do this, we don't do that. We do this, we do that. And we think by virtue of that, people should be impressed. Yeah, we're different. But sometimes, you know, we have this attitude that because we don't do something, that somehow makes us better than other people. And sometimes we have this attitude that if we just don't do something enough, in other words, if we don't do something more than other people don't do something, that that gives us some kind of, yeah, bragging rights, exactly. I want us to spend a few minutes this morning considering a few examples from the life of Jesus. He was a different guy. But a lot of times we think of Jesus as you know, somebody you visit once a week in church. And we don't realize that Jesus was the type of person who you encountered every day in ways that were very unusual. And one of my favorite verses comes from John chapter 1, verse 14. And this is taken from Eugene Peterson's paraphrase called The Message. Listen to this. It says, the word, that is Jesus, the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. We saw the glory with our own eyes. The one of the kind glory, like father, like son, generous inside and out, true from start to finish. That was Jesus. And that's what we should be about as well. Jesus came to demonstrate heavenly principles in a human body. And when he left, he left with the idea that his followers now, motivated and empowered by the Holy Spirit, should also live out heavenly principles in our human bodies. And that doesn't just mean not doing something. It means doing something, being involved, being engaged in people's lives. So I'm just going to go through a few um, experiences that Jesus had, all taken from the Gospel of John. And uh, just spend a little time examining how Jesus was different. I mean, really different. So we're going to start first in John chapter 2. And this is Jesus' first miracle. John chapter 2. Now, what would you expect Jesus to do for his first miracle? Well, let me remind you, this came in the setting of a wedding feast. So Jesus is at a wedding feast. His first miracle. And in the midst of this experience, his mother comes to him. They have a problem. No more wine. Now, a wedding feast in those days went on for several days. And so the fact that they had run out of wine before the feast was over was a highly scandalous problem. It shows that this family didn't prepare it enough. So Jesus' mother comes to him. We have a problem. No wine. And Jesus' first response is, well, why is that my problem? But she says, come on, do something. And so she tells the servant, whatever he says, do. Well, it just so happened that there were six stone jars standing against the wall. The kind of jars that they would fill with water and use for washing people's feet. 
Remember when you went to a, pe a person's home as a guest, the first thing they did when you walked in the door, took off your shoes, they washed up your feet. So here are six stone jars filled with water used for washing people's feet. And the, jo the, the um, jars held between 20 and 30 gallons of water. So six stone jars, we're talking about anywhere from 150 to 180 gallons of water. You know what Jesus did? He said, fill them up. Then he said, take a cup to the master of the house. And the master tasted the water taken from the jars. And he said, this is the best one I've ever tasted. From foot washing water. His first miracle. You've heard of it. B-Y-O-B. Jesus is bring your own wine. Not just a little bit, not just a six pack, not just a case, 150 gallons of wine. That's our Savior. He didn't do anything halfway. He comes with 150 gallons of the best wine. Not something he picked up at Kmart or Target, but the best wine. Unbelievable. This is the Jesus that we worship. This is not the Jesus that you hear about in a lot of churches. This is an unusual man. Let's go to chapter 3, John chapter 3. Jesus meets a man who's a ruler of the synagogue. His name is Nicodemus. Nicodemus wants to have a chat with Jesus, but he doesn't want to talk with Jesus during the daytime because he's ruler of the synagogue. What would his friends think, what would his friends say if they saw him talking to Jesus? So he asked to speak to Jesus at night. And so what does Jesus say? No, 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 no. Unless you're willing to speak with me in the town square at noon, you're not worthy to talk to me. No. Jesus instead says, all right, you want to talk? Let's talk. Where do you want? What time? I'll be there. That's Jesus, willing to meet people where they need to be met. He goes to meet Nicodemus. And Nicodemus starts out, you know, all this flowery stuff. He says, we know that you're a teacher come from God. For who could perform the miracles you're doing if God were not with him? Jesus says, come on, Nicodemus, let's get right down to it. You can't see the kingdom of God until you're born again. In fact, what are you talking about, born again? Jesus, you're, you're a ruler of the synagogue. You tell me you don't know about being born again? And in the course of this conversation, a fantastic conversation, Jesus says these words, probably the most famous words in all of Scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, Christians are pretty good at quoting John 3.16, but you should never quote John 3.16 without quoting John 3, 17. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus isn't about condemnation. You know, a lot of Christians, they're about condemnation. Not Jesus. Jesus came to love the world, to show them God's love, and then to say, come on, let's get with the program. You want real life? follow me. That's what Jesus was all about. And Jesus was willing to speak to Nicodemus at night, in secret, so that he could share with him this important word. That's powerful. That's the type of Jesus we serve. Let's go on to John chapter 4. Jesus is in uh, Samaria. He's come to a town called Sychar, and he sits by the well about noon while his disciples go into the town to buy something to eat for lunch. And um, a woman comes out to draw water from the well. You know this story. And Jesus says to the woman, would you give me a drink of water? Now this is highly unusual. And the woman recognized this because she says, hey, wait a second. You're a Jew, 
I'm a Samaritan. We don't have anything to do with each other. Plus, he was a man. She was a woman. Men and women didn't speak to each other back in those days. And another thing, what was she doing at the well at noon? This is the way it worked back in those days. Women went to the well in the morning to gather water for their needs for that day. They went to the well in the evening to gather water for their needs throughout the night. But nobody went at noon. So why was she there at noon? You know the story. You know the story. She, um, she says, you don't have anything to draw water with. Jesus says, that's right. But if you knew who I am, what I have to offer, you'd ask me, and I'd give you living water. She said, well, give me some of this water. He said, go call your husband. She said, I don't have a husband. And he said, well, sir, you don't have a husband. You've had five husbands, and the man you're sleeping with now isn't your husband. And then she says, I perceive that you're a prophet. She wants to change the subject. Let's talk about something else. And she says, oh, no, you don't. Finally, she goes off. She leaves her water jar. She goes into the city. And this is something extremely significant. When she gets into the city, she tells the people there, come out to the well. I've met a man who told me everything I ever did. And then she asks a question. Her question is, could this man be the Messiah? What would have happened if she had gone back to town and said to the folk there, hey, come out to the well, I've met the Messiah. They would have said, get out of here. We know who you are. We know your reputation. There's no way you're going to teach us about the Messiah. But she goes back and she said, I've met a man. He's the most unusual man. Come and, let, and see if, if there's anything to this Messiah thing. So the folks go out and they meet him. They spend some time with him. He teaches them. And at the end, they say, we believe that he's the Messiah. Not because of what you said, but because we talk to him ourselves. This is a remarkable man. Look at Jesus. This is the man we worship. The man who brings his own wine to a wedding feast, 150 gallons. The man who meets a ruler of the synagogue at night in private. A man who talks to a Samaritan woman. Let's go on to chapter it says sometime later Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews.